I'm living in Marbella, four bedroom villa with a private pool, hot wife, just married, running a business, supplement company that was bringing in great money, great money that I didn't know what to do with, but I was suicidal. One of the first things I did was I booked on a course, a 10 day course in Laguna Beach, California, where the first thing you had to do was have a fight with a man on a beach. An actual fight? Who you'd never met. Guys, Matt Haycox here, and welcome to another episode of the Matt Haycox Show. I was actually just thinking before I started speaking, I think this is the first one I've recorded in Dubai with a guest. Oh shit. It is. I think wow. anything else I've been doing here, I've been doing uh, I'm doing over Zoom or just doing my own stuff to camera. Yeah. But I'm super excited. So not only is it the first one in Dubai, I've got with me Paul Mort. I'm going to read you his official bio in a minute. But uh, I guess just to contextualise it for me, one of my favourite things about having the podcast is being able to kind of ch chat and sit down with the people that I want to sit and chat with uh, and ask them the questions that I want to ask. And I met Paul probably three years ago, yeah, three or four years ago in a, in a mastermind uh, type thing that we were both in, in England. I, I, I've never seen you since, no. uh, but follow him on Insta, love his energy. Yeah, I just thought it'd be you know, super exciting. To Mate, I'm excited. Out. I'm excited. I feel honoured. So here he is in the Also, Fox Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know what? When when I asked you if you'd do this, uh, and I think your assistant reached yeah. out and said, "How do I want to do it?" Yeah. I just thought I'd rather wait, even if it took a year to sit down with you. <laughs> it'd too. just be fucking wasted on me Zoom. too. Me too. It's just the video shit. The sound quality is not the best. It's a different conversation. I don't get lovely espressos. <laughs> yeah, do you know what I mean? What I want to see. I actually extended the trip to Dubai, the holiday to Dubai, by two days. Oh really? I was like, oh, I'm doing a podcast, so I'll have to stay, <laughs> have to stay for an extra two years now. <laughs> I'll, I'll find some way to make it feel like And then I'm wondering if I, can, if I can make a tax deductible now, can't I? Swear. <laughs> Work this. Or just never leave and then everything's back to you know, <laughs> well, it's, I kept So I was telling you just before we started filming that I came here in December 2020. Uh, and I think probably in some kind of way, this, this maybe fits into your mentality of, of, of you know, how to act and how to behave, but yeah. I've never been to Dubai before. Yeah. Um, came just for an eight day holiday in the middle of COVID. And I I think about six hours into my first day, so I arrived at 11 o'clock at night, woke up the next day, six hours into that day, I said, I'm never leaving. And really? I re re reached out to someone to start applying for a residency. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I just took the view, I fucking love it. Okay, I'm only six hours in, but I, I know, I just thought of, I just had a vibe, vibe about it. I knew I was going to love it. I'm not, I'm not thought about it so many times. I'm not going to pretend it wasn't accelerated because of COVID, because obviously it was. It was going to be depressing to go back to the, back to the UK and be locked down. Mm -hmm. But what I, um, I, I guess, my attitude was, if I don't like it, I'll, just go, I'll, I'll go somewhere else or I'll come back. And, and the, the grief, not grief, because it's the care, but the, the amount of, um, let's say, negative comments I've got from people saying, you're crazy, you know, you're not going to like it, or in four years' time, you're going to be bored. For, well, if I'm bored in four years' time, then I'll probably move somewhere else. Um, but no, it, it, it's because people think that, I think people make a big deal of decisions that actually aren't that big a deal. I think most decisions that we think we have to make, that we think are life changing, aren't. Like leaving a job isn't life changing. Closing a business down is, I don't think a lot of these decisions are. It's kind of made them more important than what they are. So, so I was talking about this recently, and my kind of expression or analogy for it is I always say, if the outcome, doesn't involve death or bankruptcy, yeah. then does it fucking matter? Yeah. And even if, it, even if it involves bankruptcy, then that's not quite as bad as death. But it's still a comeback. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's still a comeback. Exactly. Comeback. I just think, you know, everyone overthinks everything too much. Um, I mean, I, I, I've, that's always been my mentality, but I read a bit of uh, Jeff Bezos' books last year, actually, and the way that he describes it, because it's, um, I think, you know, decision-making, rapid decision-making, and empowering the underlings to be able to make rapid mm. decisions is, is a big part of uh, a big part of Amazon. And he describes it as two-way doors and one-way doors, and that, uh, you know, that most decisions in life and many, many decisions in business are two-way doors. Yeah. Okay, you, it might, there might be some cost implication, but you know, as, as a, a business with pockets that deep, you know, they, can, they can afford to do it. And, and the downside of not making those decisions you know, is it, much more outweighed by yeah. the... By, by and, the and you, like you said, you can always turn back around. Do you know what I mean? I think that people think, I, I actually think that often, it's pride that stops people from turning back. I've made that decision now, I can't change my mind. And I'm, I'm a, because I've done the moving countries thing. So I moved to Marbella, lived there for two years. Um, Hated it. <laughs> it was a very dark period of my life that. And I came home and it's one of the best things I ever did was going back home. But it's, it's, I had to swallow my pride a little bit and be like, yeah, I am. 
Do, do you think sometimes it feels like I was it felt like I was giving up a little bit? Do you think it's a pride thing then as well when it comes to well, well work relationships and mates or all of it? Because I I, I always believe and I, I always flippantly use the word let's say ninety percent of people, but whatever you know, use that for a fact. But it's a big number. I believe that eighty percent, ninety percent of people hate the job, hate the partner, and probably aren't too fond of the fucking mates either. Yeah. And the, for me, if you can't get those three things right, then nothing else in life is necessary. But it's so much easier than you think to act, you know, to, to actually change, change do you, those do things. you know why I think it is, Matt? It is, I think that people stay in those situations that they don't like, that they hate, that they complain about, simply because it's familiar, it's certain, and it's predictable. Whereas any kind of change is unpredictable, uncertain, unfamiliar. So like, people, that's why people stay in lives that they don't even like because they're, they're so they can't handle uncertainty, they can't handle unfamiliarity, they can't handle unpredictability, can't handle the unknown because that's known in it. But 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 even if it's known unhappiness, you think you, you, you think that it's easier to at least you know how shit it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I oh, also, mate, I also believe in this concept of sunk cost fallacy, where they put so much. Well, I've been here for ten years now. Eventually it'll pay off. Or I've been in this relationship for 17 years now. Why would I get? Do you know what I mean? Mm. I, I'm sure a lot of us have done that with businesses where I'm like, well, I put this much time and money into it. I can't just walk. I hate it, but I can't just walk away from it. Do you know what I mean? No, no, I think I, that's I, it. I, I think they put a lot of, they put a lot of. Uh, I think there's a lot of emphasis on time, and um, but I think the big thing that, that I see so often is that it's this concept of the, the known. At least I know how shit it is. At least I know that if I show up to this job, I'm going to get paid even though I hate it. If I try something different, I don't know what's going to happen. People are, I think entrepreneurs are probably in like the, the outliers of this because entrepreneur, you know what it's like, mate. And I've been self-employed for, you know, almost 22 years, which is bad <laughs> since I was 21. And then I think one of the key things of being an entrepreneur is that you've got to be able to handle uncertainty because you don't know where the next client's coming from. You don't know when your next shit, when you first start, especially, there's, I don't think there's that many things that are more uncertain than when you start a business. But I also think as well, you know, entrepreneurs aside, you know, when you've got your, 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 your average Joes who, 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 work, who work in a job, you know, 25 grand, 30, 35 grand a year. And, and you know, my simplistic view of this, when you're in that job and you're so unhappy, there's so many other jobs in the world. I'm not even talking about turning you into an entrepreneur, you know, trying to do anything super fancy with you. But if you're working in an office, and you're depressed as fuck earning 25 grand a year. Yeah. You could go work in a bar and earn 25 grand a year. Or you know, or, or you could probably monetize your hobby in some way. I don't yeah. know if I'm gonna like it. But that's kind of what you get all the time. I'm arguing with myself. Isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. And it's, yeah, and it's, I mean, so many times it drives me insane as well. Because I think the thing is as well, I think this whole concept of job security is fucking history. Do you know what I mean? People stay in jobs because there's a security. But I think now. At this time, and at this, I think actually there's more certainty and there's more predictability and there is more security in actually being in charge of your own destiny. Because if I think about it like this, and my team might be watching this right now, because they'll probably be doing some editing and it up, but the reality is their job relies on me being good at mine. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? The reality is if you're manufacturing widgets, your job relies on the sales team being good at their job. If they're shit, you lose your job. So there's actually, for me, in jobs, there's less certainty, there's less uh, known, there's less security. And I think that's a, a big thing as well. People think they're secure and they're not. I mean, I think, if anything, I mean, the last two, three, four, five years has to have shown that. It's, Since it's 2020, it's never walk of life. And even, I like, guess, even pre COVID times, you know, the, the, the amount of big business, you know, big international institutions. And I mean, I look at this from a business perspective as well, you know, when it comes to uh, my business is lending, is, 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 is finance, is property related transactions. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when, I, when I look at a guarantor, mm -hmm. you know, from a, an international, you know, multinational company, or when I look at a property that we might be looking to buy yeah. with, a, you know, with a national covenant in there, who's been, who's traded 30, so 300 stores the last 70 years, and people look at it, no, 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 that's, that's whoever, mm -hmm. you're a fuck. Yeah. Because on the, it, the amount of people that have been around for 70 years, 100 years, 100 years plus, and just disappear overnight like that. Yeah. I hard. mean, the, you know, the, for me, the only thing that is, is certain is uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Robbins has a quote where he says something like, the success you have in your life 
is directly correlated with how much uncertainty you can comfortably handle. And I think for an entrepreneur, there's, 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 apart from being able to sell, obviously, is that whole concept of if I can handle uncertainty, then, I'm, then I'm, that, that's the only thing I'm certain of is that I can handle uncertainty. When you've been self-employed for a long time, you know, you know that. This is why I have no problem. If I started disliking what I'm doing now, I have no problem shutting it down. Because I've done that before. I've sold the business before. So, so it's it's not as though you can't. We know that you can stop and start again. And I think many people don't think they can stop and start again. They think that's it. This is me now. Well, look, you mentioned obviously you know selling some businesses before and, and changing it before. We've kind of jumped into yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And go, go, go full throttle there. Come on. Go on, balls deep. Go on, balls deep. Let's, let's take a quick wee, wee, wee wine and just. I never even got to read it. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at it before. Like, I wonder what that's going yeah. to watch. Yeah. <laughs> no, let's, let's just, uh, I guess, put a bit of context yeah. to, to, to you and your background. Yeah. Obviously, you, you're talking now with all these. Uh, all this, this confidence and, and, and these, these theories and yeah. these quotes and this success yeah. and what you do for other people, but yeah. obviously that wasn't always you. No, no. And um, I, I guess you just go back as early as you want to go and do it as quickly as you want to quickly. So, right. so I'll, start, I'll start what I do right now and then I'll, I'll kind of rewind on how I got to where I am right now. So right now, um, my main things are uh, coaching. Start off as coaching married businessmen who need to get their shit together. And it's somehow in the last two years, especially escalated into working with anybody that wants to get the shit together. And just because my profile blew up, I got a book deal with Harper Collins. Then women started like I almost said gyrating. <laughs> <laughs> women started moving towards me. Men who weren't businessmen started moving towards me. And I do that through coaching online. Obviously, my book. I got my podcast. And I speak all over the world. I have my live theatre shows. Just a lot going on. And I suppose I ended up here. My speaking coach hates it when I say this. But I ended up doing what I'm doing by accident. So if I rewind back to 2014, I'm living in Marbella, four bedroom villa with a private pool, and a two year old son, my newborn baby was born there, Nina, and hot wife, just married, and running a business, supplement company that was bringing in great money, great money that I didn't know what to do with. Um, but I was suicidal. Why? Well, I could blame my other reasons. Probably the amount of coke I was sniffing, the amount of booze I was drinking, the amount of parties I was doing. And had that always been a part of your life? Or has it got progressive? Only when I got successful. Only when I started making money. Only when I didn't know what to do with this money. Only when I realized that I was the most successful out of all my friends and family probably put together. I didn't know anybody else that was making money. I didn't know anybody else that was, I didn't even know anyone else that's self-employed, Matt. Me, my business partner, and that was it. So it, it kind of, there was those two things involved. But what I can describe it as is, when I was 21 and I went self-employed, and I set these goals of living this dream life, this fucking four-hour work week, I think that's still a thing. Four-hour work week thing, running this business, living in this place, nice car, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't feel anything like what I thought it would when I set the goal. And I was like, this doesn't feel, is this is. Partly the boozing, partly the, the cocaine, partly the, I was isolated as well. I didn't even know anybody in my way. I moved there because I kind of ran away from where I was. I hated everyone. I was like, they're so negative, they're so toxic, all that bullshit. I cut all the toxic people out, the negative people. That was actually only left with me because I don't believe in all that bullshit anymore. But I think what happened was I, I lost my sense of purpose. So it was like I climbed this ladder of success. On the way up this ladder, I kicked people off. I'd sacrificed my mental health. I'd sacrificed my physical health. I was five stone overweight. And I'd sacrificed my friendships. I'd sacrificed, almost sacrificed my marriage. I hadn't spoken to my parents for like eight months or something. And then I got to the top of the ladder and it was like, it was leaning against the wrong building. I was like, is this, is this it? Is this what I want? And then while I was there, I was diagnosed bipolar and sent home because they didn't in spain they didn't know how to treat this bipolar shit like we don't we don't treat it so you've got to think about it from a life's point of view as well I mean, you've got me having fucking breakdowns every other week like real meltdowns you've got a two-year-old son and a newborn baby and my wife didn't know anyone either so she's like we need to get home so i went home i was like right i'm gonna get better and it actually got worse because i'm back hanging around with all my old friends again i've got easier access to gear easier access to booze, there's more pubs, more dealers, etc., etc. So it actually got worse. And then 
December the 17th, 2014 was like the low point. That's when I was ready to kill myself. So I'm on, at this point, my wife's following me, mate, everywhere I go. So I'm oh, so dude. volatile, just so volatile. She didn't know what I was going to do. So she'd back, my son would be at school, a nursery or something, preschool. And she'd have my daughter in the back of the car. And every time I'd leave the house, I'd slam the door and she'd follow me. I didn't know she was following me. And then this one day, I'd been on a fucking hell, I must have been on a three year bender. And this one day I was like, I've had enough. And my whole thing was no one gets it. No one understands me. No one would even care if I killed myself. Um, I'd isolate myself a lot at this point. There was like three phone numbers in my telephone, mate. I'd, I'd shut down all of my social media accounts. Was your business still successful? Was that oh, the business was killing it. It didn't even need me. It didn't even need me. It was a it was a supplement company that didn't require a face. I think that was part of the problem. So a supplement company's basically done all that. You know what it's like, mate. Traffic in, yeah. sell some supplements, sell a lot of them because the market was small. And the business, and I had a business partner who was way smarter than me. Um, so I was still making a lot of money at this point. Obviously, that doesn't help the problem either. Um, and then on this day, I just went, I was like, right, I'm going to do it. So I drove down the coast, probably for about two hours driving up and down the coast. In Spain? In, in, in South Shields. Back. In South Shields. So back home, I'm driving up and down the coast. We live on the coast. Um, and I just end up on this cliff and I'm like, I'm ready to do it. And my wife's running up the cliff after me, running up these, these stairs after me to this cliff. And then she said to me, Paul, she actually, this is mad. She almost considered letting me do it because I was in that much pain. I was in that much of a struggle that she, she didn't tell me about this till after. And she was like, should I just let me? Because you don't want to see someone suffering like that. Should have just let him end his pain. And then she said to me, think of the kids. And, and it's mad this, I said I am. I am thinking about the kids that are better off without me. Which is fucking insane if you think about it. But man, when you're that low, when you're at rock bottom like that, there is no logic. You're so caught up in your emotions and changing your emotions and hating the way that you feel that the logic disappears. But then she said to me something that fucking rocked me to the core. And she said to me, think about the kids there growing up as those kids whose dad killed himself. And that was like, that rocked me. That was like, fuck. And then that woke me up. And then that led me on a mad journey to fucking hell. One of the first things I did was I booked on a course, a 10 day course in Laguna Beach, California, where the first thing you had to do was have a fight with a man on a beach. An actual fight? Who you'd never met. With <laughs> boxing gloves on, and a gum shield in. But you had to have an actual fight on a beach with a man you'd never met. That was the first part of this mad thing. Um, that was called Wake Up Warrior. I watched your video this morning, actually, just in prep for the summer. Um, Jay J- Garrett. Garrett J. White. Garrett, Garrett J. White. J. White. Uh, it's funny because w- when I first started to uh, you kind of come across you know, yeah. big social media influencers, yeah. you know, particularly business ones, yeah. his name popped up a couple of times, but then I never really ever saw him again yeah. and, and never kind of knew what he was into. You're not fucked up enough, you only talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> Garrett, you'll have heard of him because he's spoken at every ClickFunnels event. Right. Yeah, so he's a big he's a big Russell Brunson guy. Um, so he, that was the first one. That kind of woke me up with some stuff. And then, mate, I just ended up, the great thing about having a successful business that I was able to travel, I was able to go on courses, I was able to do Tony Robbins courses, I was able to go and spend nine days in Germany, I was able to hire the coaches and just travel and try loads of things. and. Um, make some things work and other things and I eventually just stumbled across a bit of a formula that worked for me and then other people started started noticing what I was doing how have you lost five stone how are you so different now I'd go and speak in an event that was in fitness that was about the supplements or whatever how to build a successful fitness or, or health based business I'd speak to them people were like hey, what the fuck have you done and then I ended up not here. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But you never, there was never a, a, an initial journey to become a coach or that this, yeah. this was just to fix you. You, you were taking remember back, back, back in 2001, I was actually a personal trainer. I was a personal trainer until about 2009, 2010 when I started the supplement company. So I'd done a bit of coaching, but Garrett would always tell me, Paul, you need to be, you, your journey has been so mad that you need to be helping other people. And I was like, no, 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 fuck other people. I still hate the people. And then I just came to this realization was it wasn't people I was the, everywhere I went and there was these negative people and these fucking toxic people. There was always one common denominator and that was me. And then I was like, oh, once I figured that, I was like, actually, what the fuck am I doing? Then I started speaking events again. And then I, uh, 
I ended up winning Master Coach of the Year two years running. Um, and then this year we actually started our own um, coaching accreditation and it's all just going to be fucking nuts if I'm honest. And I don't realise this until until you've asked me, but I don't, where... people ask me all the time, Paul, do you ever look back? I'm like, not really. I don't ever look back and think, fucking hell, but we've done quite a bit. Uh, and on that day on the cliff, I mean, when you, when your missus talked you yeah. down and talked you back, yeah. I mean, was it, was it literally like a snap wake up at that point that you went home, you threw the booze it out? It was a snap wake girl. up, but it wasn't smooth. It wasn't smooth. I mean, fucking hell, mate, when, you, when you're doing lines of coke off your desk in the middle of the day, Right before you jump on a fucking, can you remember go to webinar? Go to yeah, yeah. <laughs> before Zoom crushed that business, I'll, I'll be going on a go to meeting and doing some coaching, business kind of stuff. Not not the coaching that I'm doing now. And I've been having a fucking line of coke before I went on the call. So going from that to nothing was a big challenge for me. Um, and funny enough, you mentioned boxing before. It was boxing that kind of woke me up a little bit because at this time, mate, I was still on lithium. Lithium, lithium is the the gold standard medication for bipolar and it's fucking horrific. So I went from having these big highs to these horrendous lows to fucking nothing. So I was still doing lines of coke so I could feel something because I couldn't, you're like a zombie on this um, on this medication. So then I started slowly getting my shit together. I started boxing. Boxing was like, oh shit, I've never fought before. And I got punched in the face by my friend who's a boxing coach. I was like, fucking hell, I like a bit of this. And they ended up dropping all that weight. Um, and then, I, like I say, I went, on the, I went on this fucking mad journey, found jujitsu, started helping other people, got a lot from seeing other people transform as well, and got off the lithium. This is how mad lithium was. By the way, don't ever come off medication without um, medical advice. Every week for six months, I had to taper off this, this medication. And I had to get my blood taken every single week for six months because if you just stop taking it, you die. Like you quite literally, your liver fails and you die. And how long have you been on lithium for? Because you say you, you only found maybe out about a year, okay. maybe about a year. So when yeah. you found out you were bipolar, uh, the second straight on, and, and and was the bipolar was that almost like a product of the coke and the, and the problems, or was it? They wouldn't tell me that, but I'm one hundred percent confident. Well, put it this way: right now, I don't take any medication, so I'm a bipolar. Who knows? I was never given. There was never any tests. There's never any blood tests. Just the yeah, you're bipolar. Like questions. The problem was, if you are bipolar, you have these highs and lows. So you have what's called a manic episode where you're fucking off the map and you're, you're doing all sorts of mad shit, like very confident shit that's like beyond confident. And then you've got these really bad lows. So the reality is you're either in one of those two moods. But you don't feel like So when you're, nah, but I do, if I don't manage my energy properly. If I went on a bender, you know, I did this book with Harper Collins and me in 2020, and it was a long old book. And we're recording the audiobook with a producer from ITV um, and a researcher from the BBC. And we're doing this audiobook. And at the end of it, like I can see the people from Harper Collins are crying when I'm telling some of these stories because it's not just my story in there, some of the people that have helped. And they said to me at the end, a woman from the BBC, Panorama, she said to me, Paul, do you think you'd ever end up back on the cliff? And I said, 100%. If I go back to what I was doing then and stop doing what I do now, I'd 100% end up back on the cliff. So. I just don't, <laughs> I, can't think of that. I don't think that I am bipolar. I think it was just a diagnosis that I was given. So who knows, but there was definitely a direct correlation between my lifestyle and my habits. I mean, listen, I didn't, ever, I didn't end up on a fucking cliff by accident. You know what I mean? That didn't happen by mistake. It happened through my nutritional habits, my behavioral habits, my thinking habits, my peer group habits, all of that shit added up. So. Yeah, I still often do get highs and lows, but that's just when I don't manage my energy properly. I mean, who doesn't have that? If you go and, listen, if you go and speak on a stage in front of fucking hell, if you speak on a stage in front of a thousand people, you gotta have a bit of a calm down after. Even comedians do. Do you know what I mean? Does that mean I have bipolar? No, it just means I need to manage my energy better. You mentioned the, you know, some of the people that you help. Yeah. Are, are these, these are presumably are all people that come to you asking for help. Yeah. <laughs> My question would be, it may be more of like a stupid question or a dead end question, but how, how do you help someone who doesn't want to be helped? I don't. <laughs> well, 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 I don't. How, 
Well, let's hypothetically, yeah. you, you, you're in a relationship, yes. and you know your missus or your mister yes. has got issues. Yes. And, and you, you might, great question. Yeah, this is actually a great question. How, you know, and you know that it, those issues are damaging your relationship, yeah. your mutual relationship. There's going to be an end point of the soon because, yes. because, because one of you is going to break. Yeah. Either you're going to naturally break or they're going to break, yeah. even though they shouldn't do because they're just going to get you know, yeah. pissed off and being told what to do. How, yeah. how, how do you Well, I think there's two situation? things. The first part you just mentioned, I think that the reality is when you try and help somebody that hasn't asked for help, you're going to feel like you're attacking them. So that's it. They'll instantly put their hands up. So I think, and I get, funny enough, mate, I get asked this question quite a lot by women whose husbands are struggling. And I'm like, I can't help your husband until he comes to me. Until he reaches out and says, can you help me? I can help him. So for your, your job now is just to let him know you're there. Don't keep fucking lecturing him because the more you lecture him, the more he feels attacked. And the more you'll go on the defensive. Probably the more you'll do it. But secondly, I think you got to, I think of help as an invitation. It's like an invitation to a party. I can give you the invitation, but it's up to you what you do with it. I remember when I first started doing this, mate, people would pay me money and still not do what I told them to do. They'd still be, keep up their old shit and they used to piss me right off. And then I figured that out, like, well, actually, it's, I can only, it's, the old saying is you can't, you can only eat a horse of water in it. You can't make a drink. So I figured that out. But I think that the best invitation you can give somebody is the invitation of example. Do you know what I mean? Like, if I'm an exact, I call it the lighthouse. So if I'm a lighthouse, a boat wants to come in towards me, that's cool. But if I'm a fucking tugboat trying to drag everybody in the shore or drag everybody in the port, that's exhausting for me. And if the, another boat doesn't want to come in, it's kind of fuck me as well. So I think the best way to help somebody that doesn't want to be helped is to be the fucking example. So I want a piece of that. You talk about the fact you lost five stone. If you, how important do you see fitness in the in the overall package? Like if you got all the other bits right, but you were but you were still a fatty, or, or what, yeah. what one is still, you know, I mean, I guess it's still an improvement. But do you think you could ever truly pull all the other pieces together without the fitness part? Absolutely, absolutely. Because absolutely, it's funny you could pull it together. Absolutely, no, 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 not without the fitness. You can't part. do without. The I think the fitness part's critical, and I think it's it's not about having a six pack. It's not about running fucking marathons. Nobody wants to talk about this. It's really weird, this. Everyone thinks, in the UK especially, it's like, oh, just talk. Like, fucking talking doesn't cook rice, mate. You know what I mean? I, I remember seeing a show, Harry Redknapp was in it, and it had the likes of Paul Merson, all the guys that uh, finished, Neil Ruddick, all these guys that finished playing football and then struggled with He played in my celebrity golf tag. Really? Yeah, like, hell. Uh, it, like it, it, shit. 50, 50 non-celebrity, non-athletic punters yeah. who were all in much better nick than fucking him. Yeah, mad, it? <laughs> he was terrible. Mad. So these, and this show was about oh, how talking and open up changes things. But then they all went out on the piss after. I'm like, come on, talking might be a start, but it doesn't really change anything. So the, the, the point that I'm trying to get across is right now, because I'm not, I haven't drank this year at all, so I'm doing a full year without booze. And, and I, I, I'm trying not to sound like a fucking vegan crossfitter when I talk about this. But even now I'm thinking, do I sound like a vegan crossfitter? Mental health needs physical support. Like you can't have one without the other. You think about this for a second, right? And I learned this in, in all this, if thoughts are, the, thoughts are the language of the brain, feelings are the language of the body. So most people want to feel great, they want to feel better. So if you, if you experience emotions through your body, why would you treat it like shit and then wonder why you feel like shit? It's fucking, do you know what I mean? There's an old saying that I love as well, which you, I think it's fucking Robin Sharma or someone. It's, you can't be legendary if you have no energy. Like I think energy is such a big deal. Like nothing's going to change until you change your energy. So the answer to that is, and I don't think this is even the right word. You know what I mean? I think it's more of an energy thing. Like people talk about, oh, I'm unmotivated. I'm like, what's your energy like? On a scale of one to 10, one to two. Well, it's not motivation, it's your problems. You fucking energy start there. You know what I mean? Do you know, um, do you know JP, JP Villiers? I do. Yeah, so JP's a, a very good friend of mine. Is he moving to Thailand or something? He's in Thailand. He's in Thailand. He's in Thailand. 
Yes, <laughs> so, I think he's a monk now. So, so, he, so he's, well, I was going to say he's not a monk. I guess technically he's a monk because he's become a monk, but he's not gone to be a monk. Right. He's um, he's gone to stumble into he's, he's gone through monkdom or or, right. or or whatever you call it. So he went he went and did like a <laughs> that <sounds so> bad. <laughs> monkdom, like, like a, a three week initiation course. Ah, okay. Well, that's, that's probably said completely yeah. wrong, but no, he's he's always been in, he's done some of these silent silent retreats yeah. and monk retreats and stuff before, yeah. but he's actually now gone and done. The you know the the, the, the full machines yeah, where yeah. he's been ordained or, yeah. or, or or whatever it is. But yeah. I mean, I, I've known JP for yeah I don't know, probably four, four years now. Yeah. Uh, we we met on my podcast and became yeah. very very good friends after that. He's, he's a, a guy we WhatsApp a lot. We probably only see each other physically two or three times a year. Yeah, it's always it's always super high quality high, high energy time. And he's you know he's really pushed me on. Uh, I guess on my fitness journey, exercise journey, and it's funny because we all have our, our different motivations or those different those different kind of turning points. And I've I've always exercised. Uh, you know, I play tennis. You know, I, I do boxing. You know, I do a bit of weights. But I've never. I would have always said it's funny because I would have always said I've never been in bad, in terrible shape. Yeah. But you know, I used to say, well, I'd rather have a couple of bottles of wine and have a six pack, and, yeah. and, 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 it's, and it's all the choice. Yeah. And we talk about our, our, our dark moments, and yeah. uh, you know, I've never actually actually uh, said it out loud on camera in this context. But about eight, about ooh, I've lost track of time. About eight, eight months ago, nine months ago, I'm away with this. It's, we've not been getting on good at all. We're having a show. I finish off. Uh, uh, look, look up at her, and she's like looking at her face of shit. And, like, and the energy was never good anyway at the time. I was like, what, what's, what's up? And she goes, I was looking at you, you're just so fucking fat. <laughs> wow. I was like, oh, hello. Oh, well, hello. <laughs> I like, and, and I was probably a, a bit different. Oh, you've got like a floppy <laughs> Oh, a snotty rifle. A snotty <laughs> rifle. And mate, I can't think of anything. She, she may as well have fucking stabbed me in the heart. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was a bit defensive about it. I'm not surprised. <laughs> a, a because of the way it was probably deli- the message was delivered, but I guess Shit. yeah. B because I just never really particularly see myself like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she was yeah. You know, you have got a double chin, you have got a round face. She goes, you know, I've, I've just I've never been in a relationship with someone who's as out of shape as you. And I, I'm embarrassed to show you to my family. You know, Shit. I was like, whoa. And and and, and for me, that I think it was a point where I was. On the verge, what I could have very easily gone two ways, two ways, and I could have, I could have gone. They you know what? Be, fuck you. Yeah, more, you know, t- 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 time, time for you to jog, yeah. jog on because yeah. I'm just not going to be treated or spoken to like that. Yes. But I kind of <laughs> went my other way. Let's say a bit extreme at times, which was I said, I "Tell you what, so you're fat. Let me lose so much fucking weight, as there'll be birds dropping up my fucking dick all summer, <laughs> and, and you will wish you had a fat come from a fella." <laughs> <laughs> and um, and we, went, we were skiing at the time. We, we, we went downstairs in a ski chalet. I'd, I'd, I'd take a few friends and investors there. And it was about 10 of us having dinner. And the chef's bringing out the food. He's putting all the food in front of me. I'm pushing it, pushing it to one side. Yeah. And she's like, what, what are you doing? Why are you not eating? I said, well, I'm not eating. I've just had you tell me what a disgusting Shit. guy I am to fucking shag Shit. because I'm so fat. Shit. And, uh, and I, kind of, I kind of went away from there, from, from, from that point. And, uh, you know, I mean, I was never a big drinker. I'm not a big drinker. I like my red wine, not into you know particularly spirits and beer and stuff. But uh, cut down the booze dramatically. I mean, I, I, did, I tried to make simple changes so it was, so it was sustainable. Yeah, yeah. You know, less, no chocolate, less bread, less carbs. Um, and I, I also, I also started to see, see a doctor over here because uh, it's kind of tangent of the conversation. But I think you know. Over 40, you know, looking at your hormone replacement. Oh, we're talking about TRT. Well, TRT. Well, I've had a life changing experience on TRT. All, all, all kinds of bits and bobs. Yeah. And it's really because since I've done all that stuff, I mean, I'm I'm seven eight months into this now. I've dropped thick end of ten kilograms. Oh, nice one. Uh, nice. Thank you very much. Um, I also, I've got I've got I've got an ab fighting through the fat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, I've dropped. I mean, I was a 36 waist. So I wear 32s nice. now. Uh, but I've got so much more energy. Definitely from the fitness, but also also from you know, the TRT, yeah. the, the growth of the other bits. And it's funny because when I go back to England now, I see my I see my friends or people I work with, whatever, who who all notice a difference much more because obviously you see less, you, have, you yeah, see yeah, less yeah, of it. Yeah. And then and then they're all saying, "Fucking hell, what have you been doing?" I say, "Well, listen, some lifestyle changes, but I have to I have to say I cannot over just tell tell getting your wife." To tell you that you're a fat cunt. <laughs> yeah. That's, <laughs> that, that, that's just like, you need, you need your missus to tell you she's going to leave you because you're the most disgusting guy she's ever shot. 
but um, but you must look into home, you know, as an over 40 or whatever, look into hormone replacement, look at, just look into getting your bloods and see what your problems yeah. are. To which everyone's like, pulls a face, oh, what are you fucking talking about? Oh, you're going to be injecting shit, yeah. you're going to be taking this fucking oh, yeah, yeah. You know, well, right. so, well, listen, take it from me, who, obviously all my mates, I'm never into drugs, you know, yeah. not, so I've never tried it, I've tried stuff, but I've yeah. never had any interest in it whatsoever. Um, so that you're taking this from a guy who doesn't go near drugs, doesn't really drink much, I'm telling you, this stuff is, is fucking amazing. By the way, it's nothing your body's not naturally it should be anyway. It should be on there. It'll be on the NHS soon. Well, I, men's I, depression. I mean, 100% in the next, well, I don't know, whether it's two years, five years, ten years, it will be as mainstream as something like Botox has become. I mean, you look at Botox and filler five, six, seven, ten years ago. It was Maybe one of them will be. You know the guy that helped me? Can you remember Ross Tompkins? Ross Physio. You know who he is from Durham? He was in the Mastermind. Oh, really? You know who he is? He started a company that does this. Um, and, mate, I have had, like, real, doubled me testosterone. Almost tripled my testosterone. Um, what, 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 so what were your your levels? Like eight, so my eight levels were my levels were when I first went. I was fifteen, and the doctor was like, "You're right on me. I shouldn't really give you it at 15. And then a couple of months later, I think fifteen out of what? 15, I don't know. Okay. The score was fifteen. Okay. And then I was at twelve. Nah, the last time I got tested, I was thirty-one. All right, so we must be looking at a different scale because the, the, the bloods I have. It, it says that um, the 800 is what, like as a 20 odd year old, like yeah. a 20, 21 year old, yeah. whatever, you'd probably have like an 800 level. Yeah. Mine was 400, but, but, I think, but, but I also didn't understand the importance of testosterone, which I don't think any layman does. We talk about testosterone and we think, oh, it's the shaggy hormone. You think, well, I'm shaggy. I mean, mate, I'm shaggy I'll plenty. tell you, mate. My wife's sick of it now. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, well, 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 I always used to say, I don't have a testosterone problem. I'll yeah. you know, sh- 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 yeah, a couple yeah, of times yeah, yeah. a day. I can have a testosterone problem because that's how, that's how we simplify it when we don't know what we're talking about. Yeah. But then when you understand that testosterone is there for the you know, for energy, for the redistribution of fat, for all the other stuff, you, you see the importance. Yeah. But um, but, but when, I, when I first started taking it, I was taking, taking a topical gel, not an injection. We yeah. just got to Mexico at the time. Yeah. And it got to the point where the missus was just carrying the fucking corner. <laughs> just like, just fucking leave me alone, please. Yeah. You know, <laughs> You, you asked for this. Do you know what I mean? You fucking asked for the baddest part of it is, is the, the thing I tell the lads I told them about is there's no such thing as a quick one anymore. You <laughs> <laughs> know what I mean? Oh, I have a quick one. There's no such thing as a quick one. It's a fucking workout these days, man. <laughs> but the, bit, the, the thing that I've found to be the best is my sleep's improved. But the second thing is that's improved the most is my recovery between training sessions. Because I'm a 42 year old guy sparring jiu jitsu with guys that are fucking 19 and 20. So I'm not, I've gone from being able to do maybe two or three sessions a week to five or six sessions a week, which for me has been transformative for me physical health, but also my mental health, because jujitsu is just, it's where it's at for me. Yeah, it's where it's at. So talk about mental health, a bit, bit of a tangent. And, and I like your view on this as someone, as someone, I guess, A, who suffered it, and B, B, who sees people. I mean, I sometimes maybe flippantly say, I think mental health is used, used as a bit of a, a pass and excuse, you know, excuse too too many times nowadays. It just it almost feels like, particularly with young people, everyone you meet suffers from anxiety. Yeah. You know, it says they've got bipolar. It says it says they've got some some kind of mental mental health issues. And I, I I think you know ultimately it's almost taking away from the people who truly it's almost well, everyone, tri- thinks like it, everyone thinks that these things that you catch them, you don't catch them. They're all created. You know what I mean? They're all created. Yeah. You don't catch anxiety. It's not something that you have. Depression is not something that you catch. It's not something that you have. It's not fucking contagious. Both of those conditions are created and they're created through your physiology, your body. Obviously, that's where you feel things. And they're created through what you focus on. And there's one thing that's, that people that speak to me about depression, you know, and it's particularly people that are suicidal, these people are focused on the past. They're not, they don't have a compelling future. Can't, they, don't, they don't see a future that they're excited about. They're, they haven't created goals, a mission, something to get fucking stuck into an animal to hunt. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So they can't see that. So it's, it's almost impossible for them to feel excited. But they're not sure how to do it either. People aren't sure how to do it. Everyone that I speak to, I'm like, what are you working towards right now? Nothing. Making it a Friday. It's not enough, is it? But you know as well, and it may sound like a gross oversimplification of all, all these conversations, all this coaching, but I, I really do think if you have that goal, you know, maybe one in work, maybe one at home, but if you've got a goal or two, big goals to fight towards, mm-hmm. almost 90% of everything falls into place. You know, you, you, Even just going after the goal's enough. Like, right, I'm in a part of my life right now, I'm like, I'm going to set that goal, I don't hit it. 
it's almost like I'm okay if I don't do it. I'm, I like the chase. I want to get fucking excited about because you think about it, most goals that you hit, this is going to sound mental, they're almost always a little bit of a letdown. They never they feel good for a few minutes or a few hours, and then you're like, right, what's next? Because I love the what's next part, I love the chase of it. So I like to have the journey as, as exciting as the destination because the destination is almost always a letdown, particularly when it comes to money. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and this is this is what you've done a mill. Oh, I'm nicking JP's words because because it was something he, he said to me in a conversation we were having about this. But he was saying if you can't be happy without money, you'll never you'll never be happy happy with money. And uh, and, we, and I was talking about it in the context of, of cars and those kind of things. And, and and when I first started in business, you know, it was always it was always monetary goals, you know, f- f- financial gains I wanted to get to. Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Business lives and dies on money. <laughs> No, but what I mean is, is it was kind of like my, my, my only focus, yes. my, 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 my only end game. Like I want to buy a Ferrari, I want to buy Rolls Royce, and every time I bought them, within, I mean, even the actual buying moment probably wasn't, wasn't as excited as I thought it would be, but the driving moment yeah. was even more of a fucking yes. letdown. Yeah. And literally within two or three days or a week or two, these these, these, these cars would be fucking sat my the drive. My dog's right in the fucking footwell. Every time I buy a nice car, I'm like, right, this is the one that I'm going to look after. I'm going to get it valid every week. Next thing I know, there's fucking the flurry pots in the clinic. <laughs> <laughs> my mate always described me as, as saying, yeah, I've never known someone with such nice cars who treats it with such disrespect. I'm saying, I'm saying, I've I'm never known someone else's car, but when you've got kids, it's even fucking worse. You're fucking chewing them on the back seats and everything. But but it's, you know, it's, using it as the example, it's, that's why it's just so important to have have more, I guess, more meaningful things yes. than the money. I'm, I'm absolutely not trivializing money because I, I fucking love money. Yeah, and. Too. Without, without it, we can't do all, all the things we're going to do. But you've got to have a purpose other than the money. You know, it's, it's like you've got to have the things that you want to spend it yeah. on. Yeah, I think, on. I think also the thing, the benefit that I've got, and this is like a superpower inside of my business that I have, is that my income is directly correlated with how many people I help. Like, do you know what I mean? We have a lot of people, we have a lot of shit. Though. I get a bit of shit for actually making money I didn't want to do. But I'm going to have a second. I do free Q&As almost every day on Instagram. I do free Q&As on Facebook all of the time. I've got hundreds and hundreds of videos that I put up for free. I've got three books that are fucking free. I've got an audio book that's free with an audible trial, a four quid that I get nothing of anymore. And um, the only thing I charge for is coaching. So, uh, so it just so happens I have hundreds of thousands of people for free and hundreds of people in your paid program. So it's kind of a, the side effect of being very good at what I do and helping so many people is that I get, I get rewarded beautifully for it. When you, and that allows me to get people like Tyson Fury on your podcast. Do you know what I mean? People think I pulled that interview off for free. Like, no, that, that was it. Uh, to be fair, you couldn't pay him to get him on your podcast. Stephen Bartlett can't get him on his podcast. But I know he's manager. But I still had to put some skin in the game. And I can't do things like that without money. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? So, so people, funny enough, the only people that ever kick off about the money thing are people who don't fucking have it. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, in the sense that the only people who kick off that fitness isn't important to fat people. Right? It, 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 it's, it's a parallel in any analogy. Yeah, it's, smart, you know, it's, it, it's, it's always the people who haven't got something that that, that say how unnecessary, or how how uh, you know whatever the word is. Yeah, and yeah. the thing is, I go straight back and we'll do work for free. There's never an answer. Mm. Oh, you're making money out of people struggling. I'm like, no, I'm not. There's loads of free shit here. There's a free book. There's a free list. But if you want the time, you want to take me away from my family. Which you, which you you want to you want to take me away from my family? That's gonna cost you money. It's weird that people people don't get that anyway. I think there's also a, there's a big it's it's almost like an attitude of entitlement. Not entitled to all of my time. If you want my, if you want to take me away from my family, then you put skin in the game. Just like you would expect your your employer to do. Well, it's, a, a, it's a weird thing. But whatever your business is, you know, where, where they're at, I don't know, whether you're building offices, whether you're coaching people, whether you're fixing toilets, they say, you know, why, why, is any, why is anyone doing it for and free? I, do, I just think I do enough for free, you probably do as well. Do enough for free, I put out enough free content, I put out enough free books, I give my time out to fucking charities for free. To... But I think, you know, with pretty much anyone who's out there who's a coach, who's an influencer in some kind of way, yeah. Pretty much all of their content is actually available out there for free. It is. It's, it's, it's it in is. books, it's in emails, it's yeah. in, in YouTube videos, whatever. Yeah. You know, if you if you've got the, I guess if you've got the 
the time and the motivation yourself, you, you can go away. I mean, there's nothing you can't learn nowadays. Yeah, for I food. agree. But I mean, I think ultimately you pay someone either for speed because they'll sort, yes. sort through the videos quicker, yes. or you put them in some kind of speed or sequence, or, or because you you want that you want to take that advice and contextualize it to yourself. I mean, I, I've done a few of the Grant Cardone boot camps. I've, I did a bit, bit of a bit of one on one coaching and stuff with him. Is there anything he told me one on one that I can't read in one of his books or that I don't see? No, not really. But you know, you, I guess you're doing it because you get to have that one on one specific. You know, yeah. specific well, and you get, and you, get it, you think about this, just putting skin in the game makes it more makes likely you're going to do the work. I just think because you've made an investment of money, you want a return on your investment, so you're more likely to do the work. Hundred percent. How many people have you coached now that over here? Over the years? All thousand. Yeah. And and do you put them in some kind? Do they have like a community or something as well? Though. So we have we have um, because I don't do any one on one coaching. All of my programs are group, so they all go in their own little groups. They have their own little WhatsApp. They have their own sort of meetups. Um, they have their own nights out. Um, we have our own. We have our team meetups. We have a Christmas ball. We did. Um, hundred of us did the um, original SAS selection course, which is the fan dance, penny fan, fully weighted, hundred of us did that. And um, yeah, we do, maybe do all sorts of, because I just think community, you know this, but community is fucking critical. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? Especially if you're from somewhere like where I'm from, where there's nobody around that you, well, I actually think also that you the kind of, the results that you have in your life are a result of your, your peer group. It, it, it makes you more likely, it makes you more likely to stick with all the changes you've made. And of course it does, I think so many people, so many people are trying to make changes, but that peer group is in direct correlation, of a, sorry, direct competition to their goals. So that they're on their own. They've got their friends over here, like, right, I'm not drinking, I'm gonna get in shape, I'm gonna start this business, I'm gonna double my business, I'm gonna get a handle on my mental health, I'm gonna start meditating, I'm gonna start journaling, but then all of, none of their friends do it. And then they wonder why they keep going back over here. It's very, and I would never say drop your friends. And I think for me, I still have all my oldest friends. But I just have other peer groups. Just, I have masterminds, I have jujitsu gyms, all groups, I have training partners that I train with, I have, I have a PT, I have all these different peer groups. Do you still have all your old friends who, who were the caners and the boozers and the, and the real, real problem people as well? Mm -hmm. And have, have any, have any of I don't them, expect them to change, I just spend less time with them. Have any of them wanted to change or made changes have you seen you? I'd say a few of them are, a few of them are, I wouldn't say any of them have started a business or anything, but a few of them. The senior who've got a handle, and they're always asked those. I mean, the mad thing is, they'll come. They were the first people to buy tickets for my first ever live show. Do you know what I mean? I did the, I did the, a thousand people at the Newcastle uh, Time Theatre last year, and they were the first people to bought tickets. I remember two weeks ago, my manager was going, Paul, there's no one on your guest list. I'm like, what do you mean? So, do you not want to invite all your mates and that? I was like, what? You think I'm giving them? Fuck, that's free tickets. No. <laughs> He's like, what? Not even your mum and dad. I was like, well, your mum and dad can have free tickets. But everyone else is fucking paying. <laughs> yeah, so they're, I mean, they're all very supportive. I mean, obviously, when I first started doing it, oh, you're still doing that weird meditation shit. Still doing that journaling, are you? But now they don't, even if I go on a night out and don't drink, I think. Are you too, and you're not too tired, you're just having a year off the booze. year off the booze, aye. And, and the funny thing is, I, mean, I, I said it last January, funny enough, I was coming back from Dubai, and January the 4th or something it was, and I said to my wife, I'm not going to drink this year. She goes, what for? Because I only drive. Five times a year, six maybe. So once a quarter, I'll have a drink at the end of every quarter. Is that because yeah. it's a heavy drink? As in, you're, you're, you're caning? Not caning it, maybe five or six pints. But when you only drink once a quarter, that is caning it. But just because it makes me feel shit, mm -hmm. and it's just celebrating the end of a quarter. You know, it's like, oh, well, you're 90 days for it, 90 days, 90 days. And then I said, oh, I said that last, I was like, what for? So I just want to see if I can. And I set some big goals, and I'm like, if I'm going to hit these, Two things that'll stop me down are getting sick and energy. And booze was probably the number one contributor of those two things. And I wasn't in bed for days with a hangover. I'd just be operating. That, the week after, I'd be operating at like 20%. I don't have no time for that. And I've just built a life. Funny thing is, I did a podcast on it. It's one of my most popular ever podcasts where I said, I built my life where boozing would be the most boring thing that I could do. Like, I have a life that feels electric. Like, I, it's not like, and get the weekend, people are like, what are you doing this weekend? And I'm not saying, oh, I'm not drinking. I'll be going to a match here. I'll be going to the UFC there. Or I'll be going to, uh, I'll be doing, I'll be jumping off a fucking mountain there. Or I'll be fucking, fucking jumping out of a plane there. Or I'll be doing this big climb. Always doing shit. 
always doing shit. So someone said, would you not, do you not, do you not find it boring? Like not going to the pool. I'm like, I would find going to the pool boring. Even if I was drinking, because I filled my life full of things that are more exciting than boozing. But, but when you say you're um, at like 20% yeah. you're a couple of days after boozing, it's amazing. And maybe it's because we're getting older or I don't know, but it's amazing right. the effect uh, that the alcohol has. Like, I'm, I'm not a, like a big, big drinker. I look yeah. like so. I only drink red wine. I yeah. only red wine that, you know, that I really want to drink. Yeah. But you know, I, could, I love to have you know, a couple of glasses, bottle, yeah. whatever. But if I, nowadays, if I have to say two glasses, two and a half glasses yeah. on a night, yeah. I'm obviously not remotely pissed. Yeah. I wake up the next day and I'm so groggy, yeah. I'm so slow. Yeah. But it's funny as well, I mean, I've, I've had a few issues on a work over the last week or two. Yeah. Very, very stressed. And one of them got resolved about two nights ago. Yeah. And the missus had gone out, I thought, you know what, I just need something to celebrate that, yeah. that resolve. Yeah. Um, I thought, I'm not going to drink because I feel like shit tomorrow. You know what, I'm going to go have a proper curry. So I walked down to the marina here, find this nice little curry house where I sat on my own. I've ordered two big starts as a main course. Yeah, fucking eaten come on. A lot, eating all this. Yeah. And even two days later, I'm saying, I was so to Tara this morning when we were in the boxing gym. I said, fucking hell. I, I, I wish I just had two bottles of, two, two, two <laughs> bottles of wine instead. <laughs> like, when, you, your body just gets you used to shit, doesn't it? When I was 18, when I was 18, I could go out, have 10 pints, five Jaeger bombs, fucking three E's, a gram of coke, <laughs> get in at 5 a.m., turn up for football, Score a fucking worldie, get man of the match, and then be fine. Like, get in at five a.m. and be get man of the match at fucking eleven a.m. <laughs> and that has to be the quote that we know. <laughs> that, that, that is the real force. <laughs> <laughs> when I was here, you know, it was a long time ago. That one, mate. Listen, Paul, I could sit here and talk for hours and hours. And hours. I know it's, it's been a long time coming. It's been great to have you, and I really, really hope we can Thank do, you so much, do a round two. Uh, but I'm conscious you're going to. Thank you so much for having me. But uh, guys, if you've enjoyed listening, which I'm sure you've enjoyed listening or watching as much as I've enjoyed talking to Paul, Paul, where can everyone find you? Uh, best place is Instagram, at Paul Mort One. You can find me on YouTube, you can find me on Spotify, podcast called Paul Mort Talk Shit. Um, and you can find him on that cesspit known as Facebook as well. <laughs> and guys, as always, I'm the Matt Haycox, T H E M A T T H A Y C O X on pretty much all my social channels. If you've watched this, you can listen to the audio ones where unfortunately you don't get to see my pretty face, but you can you can drive along in your car and find me on iTunes, on Spotify, and all the ways you listen to your podcast. If you've been listening to this, you can watch video versions too on YouTube, Insta, TikTok, and wherever else you want to find me. And until next time, I've been my Haycox, he's been Paul Mort, and we'll see you on another episode Peace of the Haycox Show.